Uh, thank you very much. And yes, actually, Lee is one. We're very proud to announce today. Lee standing in the back has joined uh, Replicel. Um, I've poached him from Arm and from the regenerative medicine consulting business, and we're delighted to have him. So, which one of these is the the big one? Okay. Uh, so, quick overview. So, Replicel Life Sciences is an autologous cell therapy company. We are developing uh, treatments for chronic tendinosis, aging and sun damaged skin, and pattern baldness. These are all cells. The cells are are being derived from the hair follicle at the back of the head. Uh, we're going into a phase one slash two in the area of tendinosis. We're going into a phase one in Germany for aged and sun damaged skin. And pattern baldness is a phase two that will also be done in Germany. In parallel, our partner, Shiseido Corporation, will be conducting their own series of clinical trials in, in Japan under the new uh, rules of regenerative medicine. So we're essentially going to have four clinical trials going on next year. Um, our current focus um, in terms of partnering uh, is actually in Japan in the area of um, uh, chronic tendinosis, um, particularly focused in Japan because of the ability to do geographically um, organized territorial licenses. So near-term uh, milestones really are those three clinical trials, including um, Shiseido, which would be the fourth. Um, and good news for us is that the readout for the um, dermal fibroblast platform, which is chronic tendinosis and um, sun and aging skin, will read out next year, which is actually a pretty um, good timeline for us. And we actually have, the, have developed a generation two injector, both for the scalp and for the, uh, the face. So why, uh, why the hair follicle? Well, as it turns out, the hair follicle, particularly in the back of the scalp, is a, is a, has a unique set of cells. In terms of the fibroblast, the sheath of the hair follicle is a, um, is a source of fibroblasts that are quite young. They've, they've actually, unless there's been trauma or a cut to the back of the scalp, they've hardly done anything other than maintain that sheath throughout their life. Uh, so they are a great source of, uh, of fibroblasts that are prolific producers of type 1 collagen, which, of course, in wound healing is essentially what we're trying to do. Um, in terms of the, um, of the uh, dermal sheath cup cell, the powder blue at the bottom, these are the specific cells that are responsible for maintaining uh, the volume of dermal papilla cells. And those, the volume of dermal papilla cells directly correlate with the uh, length and thickness of the hair fiber. So, um, these dermal sheath cup cells in people who suffer, men and women who suffer pattern baldness, when they're compromised by the androgen hormone, their population diminishes, and that leads to a, a smaller number of dermal papilla, and therefore every hair follicle cycle a smaller hair follicle. All we're doing is taking these cells from the back of the scalp, a single, single punch, um, punch um, biopsy, single suture closure, and we isolate in a case of... Um, um, of the dermal fibroblasts or the cup cells, we isolate about 20 to 25 antigen growth stage hair follicles, and we isolate the particular cells that we need. In the case of the fibroblasts, um, it is the upper sheath. In the case of the, the cup cells, it is the, just the little part at the bottom. These are replicated over a period of about five to eight weeks. They're frozen, and then they're sent back for reinjection into the area um, of, of treatment. Specifically, for an example, if you think of chronic tendinosis, chronic tendinosis is essentially an, an, a chronic wound. In other words, um, when you've had that initial tendinosis or you've had a micro tear or a series of micro tears, it is not completely um, healed, and then you get a re-injury. So you get a cycle of incomplete healing, which leads to a degenerative um, state. And in the case of um, this picture, just to give you an idea, the the, the the bottom line, I can't actually um, image it, but the, the, along the bottom you see the leg and on the right hand side you see the heel. And the black area above is actually that wound. That's disaggregated tissue and there's mu not much left of this linear alignment of a type 1 collagen. And below you see that same patient, a 63 year old uh, high court judge from London actually. Um, you better plug in because we're losing power here. Uh, <laughs> you can see them six months later where you have the, the, the swelling has gone down, the wound has started to close almost completely, and you see that linear alignment of type 1 collagen. And this person um, was returned completely to um, normal activities. Uh, this is the data for that particular trial. It was 24 patients um, that were treated for unilateral chronic tendinosis. 
the uh, control, it wasn't placebo, it was control. The control was um, uh, plasma. And so you see that on the right hand of the function chart at the top, you can see where the, the tissues, the, uh, the, the cell treatment actually returned people to normal function and at the bottom essentially returned them all to zero pain. So essentially almost complete healing at six months. That has led us, and, and those cell, or that treatment actually was done using a dermal-derived fibroblast. We're now using a uh, fibroblast that is derived from the hair follicle that is much more um, prolific in the production of type 1 collagen. The phase 1-2 trial is going to be done at the University of British Columbia. It has 28 patients. 21 are going to be treated and 7 are placebo. We're really, it's a safety trial, but, you know, in terms of efficacy, we're measuring at 26 weeks. Uh, the center, the University of British Columbia has a huge registry of patients that because it's quite a sports um, community, um, a huge uh, register of patients who are the sort of the weekend warriors who continually continue to tear themselves and um, have got the ability to enroll that trial quite quickly. And this trial will report out uh, within a year of start. We're using that same cell type to deal with um, uh, sun aging and sun damaged skin. In this case of, of the trial that we're going to do in Germany, it is not actually going to be done in the face because um, that only tells us whether it's safe. We're actually having injections done on either side of the buttocks. There's four injection sites, and this is to allow us to go in after one injection being placebo, one injection being a single inject, one site being a single injection, and a second site a double injection, and a third site a triple injection, and then afterwards we're going to go in after six months and biopsy these sites in order to measure the actual change in the skin. So we're going to, some of the, the um, samples are going to histology, and other samples are going to, um, for fax analysis, to measure the ger generic bio, uh, uh, the gene biomarkers, um, because what we want to actually, we know it's safe, um, ostensibly, but what we want to know is what did we do to the actual skin? And we couldn't do that by injecting somebody in the face. So the Paul Ehrlich Institute, which is a governing body in Germany, was very pleased to see this kind of trial. So to pattern baldness. Again, if you look at the, the dermal sheath cup cell, the powder blue at the bottom, that is a cell type that maintains um, essentially the health of the hair follicle. At the bottom of that hair follicle, that whole sort of bulb region in a resting phase, disaggregates. There's no, there's no actual structure to that unit. The cells are just hanging out. So you can imagine that if the dermal sheath cup cell is the population that's affected by those who suffer androgen, you need to replace that every cycle, um, or, or you need to replace that if you're going to get a serial conversion of back to a healthy hair follicle. So what we do is we take dermal sheath cup cells from the back of the scalp that are immune from androgen, and they are for everybody. Why? We don't know, but nevertheless, if you take that cell population, you replicate them, then you deliver them into the area of, of um, pattern baldness, what we're looking to do is get a serial conversion to a, a healthy uh, dermal sheath cup cell population, and that can happen over that um, hair follicle cycle. So when it's in a resting phase, some of them will be in a resting phase, you'll be able to inject and get the integration of healthy dermal sheath cup cells into that hair follicle cycle. Uh, we all know what the gold standard is. It's mycotransplant surgery, and it is in, in, in the hands of a gifted surgeon, it is a great outcome. The problem is that there's not that many gifted surgeons. In terms of the drug, you really are just reducing um, the, the rate of decline. In other words, you're sort of keeping the tide away until such times it's too high. And in the case of uh, Rogaine, you know, Typically, men can't be trusted to take a 10-day antibiotic, <laughs> let alone have to take Rogaine every day. And that treatment has to be maintained or otherwise the gains are lost. And what, the same thing with Finisterid, although it can't be used with women. The problem with both of these treatments is they have certain side effects and you have to take them all the time and, you know, people just lose that. Um, what we did in our phase one, and both of those drugs, by the way, you know, at best they did 16% density increase at 12 months. Um, we, at a six-month period, averaged 11.8 density increase um, at six months for the responders greater than 5%. Uh, 
um, at six months. So, you know, really what we're measuring in our next phase is 12 months. But if you think of um, the response rate, we had a two-thirds response rate at six months. The density increase was 11.8%, and 70% of those patients actually averaged uh, greater than 10% at, and I think came in at 14.3%. Um, that's a pretty good start in a, in a small 16 patient trial. And it was this data that led us to be able to license with Shiseido Corporation in Japan. And Shiseido Corporation has since built their own purpose built uh, cell isolation and expansion facility that they're <clears throat> from which they're going to run their clinical trials in Japan. So where are we going with the phase two? There's two things that we have to, to, to now determine. One is, what's the dose? Isn't that the story of our business? The dose and frequency. So um, there's going to be, uh, in this trial, there's going to be almost 400 data points versus <coughs> the 16 in the, in the phase one. We have a treatment group that has four um, injection sites, three different doses and a placebo, um, randomized, of course, and, and, and a single injection period. and then. To, to answer that question of frequency, do we need to get more dermal sheath cups into those quiescent hair follicles to get a serial conversion of a healthy cell population? We're doing one group, that a matching group that has an injection at day one and at day 91. To answer that question of frequency, and then we have the corresponding and matching placebo groups. Uh, this is going to be a, a uh, it's going to take two years to do this trial because we're measuring 12 months after the last injection, so that means you know, you've got your enrollment period of about three months, and then um, you're making a single in, or a second injection at uh, at uh, three months. So that's a 15-month trial for the um, for group two. So it's going to be out for two at least two years. Uh, again, this is uh, the 16 patients that we did actually drove the license, which to us was quite important in terms of third-party validation for a geographic license with. Uh, uh, Shiseido Corporation, as I mentioned earlier, they've built their own purpose-built facility, which is right next to Professor Yamanaka. Uh, they are, we did a $4 million upfront payment, $31 million in milestones, and single-digit royalties. As you will know, in two weeks when the regulations come out, how what they, the new Japanese rules are, but uh, suffice to say that it's, it's it's expected that you'll be able to prove safety, and once you, and, and then once you've established that safety, um, and you have, are comfortable with your dose, then you can go sell the program. Uh, so we're very excited about that, and we're actually looking to use that kind of platform in our tendon area. Um, importantly, we are collaborating with Shiseido, so we have uh, joint um, steering committees. We share in, in technology improvements on both sides. The technology transfer is essentially completed, but from our group to Shiseido, um, and now um, we're actually going there next week to BioJapan to meet with them again and other uh, Japanese companies around the potential for partnering. I mentioned briefly um, that we developed a Generation 2 injector device. Uh, what's just important about this is the, the injector device that you see below has the ability to have different heads for different kind of injections, including um, the type of needle, the configurations of needle. But the important thing that's on this that that doesn't exist anywhere is that the head contains something called a pelche element, which means that we can freeze the skin, and anybody who's from Canada can understand where I'm from, that you, once you've frozen your skin, you pretty much can't feel any injection. Um, and so this will be able to allow us to remove any need for an anesthetic. So what does that mean um, uh, to, in terms of a commercial asset? Well, if you can imagine any kind of dermal injection that, con that currently uses lidocaine or some other form of anesthetic prior to the injection or even in the material that it's injected with, um, which, which they still use a uh, primary anesthetic, we can obviate the need for any kind of anesthetic in the injection of whatever that cartridge could contain. So think of the dermal filler market. And that's something that we're going to go out and start to license into the dermal filler market. So potential therapeutic applications, I've talked about the tendons. You can imagine any kind of tissue. This is wound healing, really. We're not going after superficial wound healing. But the one important thing to mention here is gingivitis, because that is a disease that really um, is, is, is growing. And the solution to regenerating or rejuvenating that, that collagen tendrils that hold that teeth and the tissue structure itself is something that people have had a struggle to do. 
So there's a lot of time, a lot of things happening in the next quarter. We've got three trials that we're filing, um, and Shiseido should start their trial. We have report out for two of those trials next year. We have the device that we should get approved for next year. So a lot of things starting now and, and reporting out next year, and then we become that sort of cycle where we're reporting a lot of data um, in, in sort of in sequence. Um, it's a publicly listed company in Toronto and in the United States, in the OTC. Um, we have about $4 million in cash, and of course, um, the burn rate is about 350000 like every company. That's what we do. We burn money to create value. I think important uh, message is that almost 50% of the company is still owned by insiders, so we've been very diligent about keeping everybody together. In terms of the overview, um, again, as I mentioned, three clinical trials that are planned for this year. Uh, they, two of them report out next year, which is sort of near term. Uh, the Durham trial should be uh, shorter than 12 months. The tendon trial will probably take 12 months. We are actively seeking partnerships in Japan. We'll begin North America partnering at some point in the future. Um, the injector device approval should happen later next year. It'll be um, just a 510K or CE mark. It's just a f sophisticated hypodermic needle, but it has tremendous potential to be able to, um, to partner out and to monetize through licensing. So that said, if there's any questions, I'd be very happy to take them. Well, then I won't keep you from lunch. All right. Thank you very much. Oh, one quick question. Sure. No, because it's, it's, um, it basically has a sensor. So it gets to a certain temperature, then injects, and that's it. And a Pelche element, is, it's 50s technology. It's two metal plates with fins between, and you run amps through it, one side and out the other. And it's, depending on the amperage, you can turn it off and on instantly. So it's very quick and very controlled. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, please thank me, or please join me in thanking.